Crook Tales for Two, page one, chapter one. Hello and welcome back to my writing journey. I'm Ellen Byram, author of The Crime of Fashion Mysteries and soon to be published Crook Tales for Two. And it is of Crook Tales that I'm thinking today. I'm going to read a selection from it. I'm going to read the first part of the first chapter this week, then I will conclude it next week with the second part of the first chapter. I thought it would be fun before my book is published. I want to remind you all that it is available for pre-order on Kindle, and if you order it, it will appear like magic on your reading device the day it comes out, which is January 20th. Without further ado, Crick Tales for Two, Chapter One, Page One. It occurred to me that if I hadn't tried to do a good deed and return the gold watch Mr. Scavulo left at the lunch counter, a strange man wouldn't be holding me at gunpoint. That was the problem with good deeds. Unintended consequences. I had no idea that following Scavulo would bring me trouble. For heaven's sakes, I used to see him and his wife at Sunday Mass at Our Lady of Pompeii. Rumors that he was involved with the Mafia were just that. Rumors. I'd paid no attention to them, and here I was, frozen with fixed gaze on the man with the gun. Was he going to shoot me? People were killed every day in New York City, but it wasn't my time to go. Women had power now, and the vote. Prohibition was over, and my play, my first play in this city, was about to open in an almost respectable Broadway theater in a matter of days. I was only 25. There was no way I was going to end up shot dead in an empty elementary school. However, the man with the gun didn't know that. I stared at him, my powers of speech rendered mute by fear. He stared back, but made no sudden moves. He was tall, his brown hair streaked with sunlight. The small space was illuminated by a dim electric bulb that showed the gunman's eyes improbably blue, as if colored by neon tubes. His face was long, and he had a sharp, square chin. There were women who might consider him handsome, if they could forget about the gun. But he was some kind of gangster. He had to be. His black pinstripe suit and black shirt were practically a calling card, and his blue tie, matching those electric eyes, was cheekily decorated with martini glasses. I knew a thug when I saw one. I've been to the movies. What are you doing in there? he asked. I could ask him the same thing. It took me a moment to realize his accent wasn't from New York or New Jersey. Well, he trained his blue gaze on me. I'm hiding. I heard shouting and a gunshot, I managed to say. I was, in fact, in some kind of utility closet in the school building where I'd followed Scavulo. His gold watch weighed heavy in my pocketbook, not to mention on my mind. I didn't know why school wasn't in session. Then I remembered... It was Columbus Day. President Roosevelt had just declared today, Friday, October 12, 1934, a brand new holiday, thrilling school children everywhere and appeasing his Italian-American constituents. That's why the building was empty. Well, almost empty. I'm supposed to believe that. Believe you. I placed his accent. English. Perhaps high class. Like that handsome actor, Robert Donat in the movie The Count of Monte Cristo. How terribly, terribly improbable. You can't command me at the point of a gun. Brave, silly words. Where were the witty lines I was able to write for my characters? I believe I can. He had the nerve to smirk. Still, he lowered the gun, but he didn't slide it into his shoulder holster. Who are you, and why are you here? I explained as efficiently as I could under the bizarre circumstances about Mr. Scavulo and his gold pocket watch and how he'd seemed distracted earlier. Scavulo had glanced at the timepiece and left it on the lunch counter at the diner, which was close to the theater where I worked, the Washington Irving, and where I was having my first play produced. I told the man with the gun I was a playwright. He didn't seem impressed. On days when I wasn't in the mood for a ten-cent sandwich at the automat and I needed to get away from my job, I sometimes ate at Ray's diner. That's why I knew Ray was more likely to pocket the watch for himself than to see it returned to its rightful owner. Ray had that kind of reputation. Because I knew Scavulo's family from church, I tried to follow him to make sure he got it back. He relied on his timepiece. 
When Father Rapoli's sermons grew long, I would notice Dante Scavulo surreptitiously lift the watch from his vest pocket and take a peek, no doubt judging how many minutes were left. It was a pretty timepiece. A small window showed the phases of the moon in blue and silver. Sometimes it chimed on the half hour and he hurried to shut it off. Other times he would open the back to check on something. Why did I know so much about the stupid pocket watch? Perhaps I wasn't listening to the sermon the way I should have. Scavulo may have winked at me once or twice when he witnessed me watching his watch, as if we shared a secret. His wife, Juliet, would swat him and glare in that way wives had, and Scavulo's prized possession would return to his vest pocket until Mass was over. I tried to follow him, but Ray made me pay Scavulo's tab first. The Brit looked skeptical. I rushed to explain. Everyone knows Ray's a skinflint, and he takes anything left on the counter. He forgets to bring your change, too. Ray was angry that I grabbed the watch before he could. That's why he delayed me. I'm not sure I believe you. How do I know you didn't lure Scavulo here with the watch? Lure him? What are you talking about? I don't even know where he is now. He left the diner before me. I was trying to follow him to give him back his darn watch. The gunman leaned against the door jamb. Is that what you do, follow strange men into empty buildings? How dare you? I don't follow men. I'm a playwright. And Mr. Scavulo isn't strange. I know him from Our Lady of Pompeii. You're a churchgoer. And you're a Brit with obviously very little knowledge of religion. Guilty on both counts. But why should I believe this watch and bull story of yours? Was he amused at me? Believe what you want, Brit. How dare he doubt me, and I had no reason to believe this mug. I was offended by his tone and his accent. I sneered at him. I realized it could have been my last sneer, and I didn't want to waste it on the wrong person. And I shall continue. The gun wavered, but did not take aim. Mr. Scavula was a block ahead of me. I caught sight of him turning into the building. I didn't know why Scavulo did that. I simply wanted to get rid of the watch. Now, even more so... And you trotted right into his closed school. He sneered right back at me. Closed but not locked, as did you, I snapped at him. We seem to be in a regular public elementary school with that peculiar smell of pine cleanser that hits you when you stroll through the door, like any school across the land. The red-brown linoleum floors were polished to a high shine. Each classroom door had a clear window through which you could see the green chalkboards sporting the ABCs. Today, those windows were free of small, smudgy handprints. I'd entered a long hallway lined with doors on either side. The closet in which I hid was near the far exit. The stranger stepped closer to me. I thought I could dash in and find Mr. Scavulo and hand over the watch. I have to get back to work. I gestured, but he stopped my escape. If that's all you wanted, how did you wind up in here with the dust mops? Sounded like a gunfight, one to which I wasn't invited. Even this English buffoon should realize that any sane person would find a place to hide from gunfire. I was too far from the front door to exit the way I came. It's hard to hide when you're making such a racket. Not my fault, I said. I had tried a few doors until I found one unlocked, a crowded utility closet where I could lay low. It would have worked, too. Everything was fine. I shared the closet with a placid tortoiseshell feline calmly licking her paws, apparently collecting herself after the first shot. I had no idea where the cat came from, although it could have been from a high window, which was open a few inches. Everyone knows cats seem to have no bones. But when more shots sounded, it bolted upwards to a top shelf, upsetting boxes of Christmas ornaments in its wake. It proceeded to create a cacophonous reign of cat terror before disappearing who knows where. Glass balls of every color fell and shattered around me, setting off a chain reaction of more shiny things cascading downward, clattering and crashing into rainbows of glass shards. The whole ridiculous incident could be in a play. I caught my breath, and for a few moments I thought I was fine. I waited to see if anything would happen. That's when the closet door burst open and this pinstriped gangster appeared, compact blue steel automatic in hand. We were locked in a staring contest. That's part one of chapter one. I'll meet you next week with the other part of chapter one. And I wanted to remind everyone that my book, Death on Heels, is out. I finally have my beautiful copies, and you can find it on Amazon. Soon it will be an ebook.
that's all I have for now, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye!